market. And what we have today is, um, is, is a uni, uni, unilateral problem. Every business in America, large or small, is facing the same challenges. Yeah. Lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. For the United States, it's 3.6%. Unheard of. That's what the equivalent of full employment is. New York State, it's 4.6%. And Westchester County is 3.5%. So there's no, no, uh, you know, we all understand why it's so hard to find, find employees. When you have real, you know, when you have that low unemployment, it becomes, you know, in real estate terms, it's a buyer's market. The, uh, the folks out there looking for jobs have their pick and the employers have to make themselves very attractive to those employees to if they're going to have any success in hiring. And January, just a couple of more statistics, 4.3 million people quit their jobs. And I think probably in March, there was another 4 million that quit their jobs. Um, and as it is right now, they said 45% of the millennials are planning to leave their jobs. So it's a very difficult market. But this is where I get people upset. There's no magic bullet here. Um, there's no website, there's no placement agency, there's no perfectly written job description that's going to change your ability to hire in this market. It's just a fact. Um, what you have to do is, number one, a lot of companies still have a pre-pandemic mentality. Oh, pandemic's winding down, we're going to go back to things as they once were. Not happening. The future is a hybrid work environment. Remote work is now a pillar of the workforce. It's not gonna change. And the reason being is because there's still a lot of things going on. The pandemic is not gone. We all know that. We, we, we wish it weren't so, but it, it isn't gone. There's still fear, whether it be rational or irrational. Um, an example of irrational fear was I saw somebody, I was in a line at CVS at the drive up window to pick up a prescription the other day. And I saw the woman in the car in front of me put on her mask to hand her credit card through the little window. Like what's going to happen? Uh, there are still people who have children at home who are not vaccinated or not eligible for vaccination. They're fearful of coming back to work. They don't want to bring it home. And then there's just people that are concerned about the overall health and safety of the workplace. Imagine yourself being in one of those high-rise buildings in Manhattan. You're getting into a crowded elevator and somebody coughs or sneezes. We all know what your reaction is going to be. It's, you're, going to, you're going to flip out because, oh my God, what just happened? Because we're conditioned for that. So remote work is here to stay and people have to accept that. The other thing that's happened to, to cut back on the number of employees that are available during the pandemic, a lot of employees just went off to join the gig economy, basically become self-employed in whatever field of endeavor they were working in. And that is another source for companies that are having a hard time finding employees. Instead of looking strictly for part-time or full-time employees that are on your payroll, you might be able to solve some of your staffing needs with gig employees or consultants. You know, as an HR consultant, we're finding a lot of companies have given up on trying to staff their internal HR functions. We have, we've shown them that it can be cheaper and more effective to use us as an outside resource than to spend the full salary and benefit costs of having a full-time employee. It's unique to every situation. So, you know, you have to evaluate it, but it's another source of potential employees. Here's some key stats. Nine out of 10 organizations will be combining remote work and on-site work. 75% um, of companies that have undergone a digital transformation reported stronger growth than before they have done that. Um, here, another statistic, 47% of employees say they would look for a job if their employer did not offer a hybrid work model. And here's the other thing that I think employers lose sight of. So two years ago, you sent your employees home to do the work that they would normally do in your office location or whatever site they might do it. They've been home for two years, collecting the same salary. You've effectively given them a pay raise over the last two years. They don't have any commutation expenses, no dry cleaning, no coffee expenses, no lunch expenses. And now you want them to come back to the office and take, and take effectively a pay cut. 
something to think about as with all these, you know, with all these folks that are still out. Interestingly, of this, these statistics, 20% of companies that have a remote workforce had a work-related security breach. Now, I would say that that's not that's something. Yes, you should be concerned about, but instead of using that as a marker to say we're not doing it, the more important thing is to look at this from the standpoint of saying we have to do it better. So, what can you do? We are all consumers. Whether we're going out to dinner or we're going to buy a new suit or a piece of a, a piece of furniture, where do we like to go to shop? We want to go to the store or restaurant that has a reputation for great service, quality product, and a good, a good experience for the consumer. Well, in this marketplace, with hiring being so difficult, the employees or your prospective employees, they are the consumers. As I said earlier, they are the buyers. And they're looking at companies from the standpoint of who's got the best offer. Who's going to give me the best value? Who's going to give me a great op a great place to work? Because there's a lot of choice out there. So you as an employer need to look at your brand. What is your brand? It is the aligning your values and culture and personality to what employees are looking for. Um, it's, it's a very important, probably the most important tool in attracting and even retaining talent today. So what do prospective employees see when they look at your company? Do they see a company that is, is on social media, doing good things, promoting from within, honoring their employees, taking the right stand on political issues? What do they see? And I would highly recommend that everybody on this call, Google your company, Google some of the key leaders, see what you find out there. It's very enlightening in some cases. Now, a lot of the organizations of BRI are smaller, so there may not be a lot, but you never know. Because whatever goes out on social media, whatever's out on the internet is permanent. And anybody who's got some good curiosity can do a lot of research and find some very interesting information. The other tool out there to look at your company is a tool, if you don't know, it's called Glassdoor. It's a great source of employee reviews on companies. And every company, large or small, hiring or not hiring, should look at Glassdoor periodically to see what's out there about their company. Is it good news? Is it bad news? Uh, how are they rated? Are they a five, which means they're doing really well? Or are they down at a two or a three? Are they, you know, what, what is, what's out there from the employees? And again, this is all stuff that is readily available. And you should be, uh, you as an employer should be aware of what your prospective employees are seeing. And then your social media presence. Are you showing pictures of, of a fun time at work? It's, uh, you know, uh, genie pants day. It's uh, fresh fruit Fridays. Are you showing those things where the company, there, there's a lot of team activities, people are smiling and happy. These are things that people want to see. So this is all impacting your brand. Again, think of yourself as that consumer as well. Where do you want to go shop? It's the same thing for employers. Where do you want to go work? So just to go through, an employer brand is a mutual value exchange of give and get. What do I have to give the employees and what are they going to get in return? And there has to be a balance or the balance has to be a workable equation depending on which side you're on. Um, your brand is, a, is deliberately establishing your company's value, work culture and personality to make sure that they align with what the candidate's aspirations are. And um, bottom line is what is it about your company that makes me wanna work there? It's pretty basic stuff, but it's important. Okay. Now, where does this all get us? We want to become, and this is an important term, we want to become an employer of choice. Okay? Employer of choice is another, is, it's a term that's thrown on of companies that people want to work for. People know about these businesses through their social media profiles, through their reputation, through the employees that work there. And they get a good vibe from that. So to become an employer of choice, there are about five critical areas that you have to think of today. And, and, I, and I categorize it as today because 
probably pre-pandemic, some of these weren't as critical. The first one is compensation. Everybody who takes a job is taking it to get paid to earn a living. Is your compensation competitive? And I mean it from the competitive standpoint of not just, well, my gut reaction is I'm paying the same amount per hour as Joe down the street at his company. Gut reactions don't count. When was the last time you as an employer did a compensation study, did some benchmarking for not only the similar companies in the area, in the industry, similar positions, but actually did a legitimate survey of compensation? Other things with compensation, are you looking at just compensation as salary and benefits, or are you looking at a total rewards model? We encourage a lot of companies to show their compensation in a total rewards model, where you're taking into account compensation, benefits, vacation, paid time off. It creates a totally different perspective, and that's something to be thought of in a competitive environment. What do your benefits look like? Are you just giving run-of-the-mill health benefits? What are your contribution rates? Are you paying the full cost of benefits? Most companies are not today because it's so onerous. Uh, do you cover the, uh, a single employee? Do you cover a family? What other benefits are you, are you offering? Com employees want enhanced benefits. They not only want health insurance, and a lot of these are voluntary benefits, but they want access to vision, dental, maybe long-term care, legal services, help with, uh, with home care for maybe some aging parents. So there's a whole litany of benefits that can be layered on to your existing benefits that employees would be happy to pay for, but they don't have access to it unless the company brings that forward. Engagement, employee engagement. Employees wanna be involved in the business. They wanna feel like they're part of something. Um, you know, connection. One of the articles I read recently was there's a big problem for companies that have remote employees that are in faraway places and managers are having a very hard time connecting with them. They're feeling really left out in the weeds. And that's a big thing. So it's, it's connection, it's engagement, having them be part of something, having meetings where people are brought in, having meetings where just a simple tool in meetings is to start the meeting, start, the, you're bringing in a bunch of employees. Have the first 10 minutes of the meeting, talk about the employees, what's going on in their lives before you get to the subject of the meeting. What'd you do this weekend? How was that party? How's your family? Let them get to know each other, be engaged with each other, then go to the subject matter of the meeting. So employee engagement is very critical. Nobody wants to feel like they're on a deserted island by themselves. Here's a very important one, company values. Where does the business stand on social and moral issues? And we all heard about the Disney situation in Florida. And I'm sure after last, yesterday's announcement with Roe v. Wade, there's gonna be a lot more that people wanna see their company do it. And companies have to take a stand because the employees want them to. Um, they want, to, they want uh, to be, they wanna know that their employer shares the same values with them. Another big issue is diversity, equity, and inclusion. 72%, it's a mind-blowing number, 72% of workers said that diversity, equity, inclusion policies and practices at their employer was critically important to them. And they want to feel like they're, in a, they're being heard. It's a diverse workplace. There's equitable, dis, equitable attention to everybody, and they want to be included. Very important. We as an organization right now happen to be doing a lot of work in that area. We have not-for-profits whose funders are starting to push them. What are you doing about DEI? We have for-profit companies that are getting pushed by suppliers that want to know what they're doing about DEI. So this came about, this really hit the forefront after the George Floyd situation. It really became a very critical issue. And as we move into these new uncharted waters, it's a very important thing to be considering. And DEI as an, as a, uh, as a, as an issue to be addressed is not something that can be done as a performative thing where you slap a label up on the door and say, everybody's welcome. It is a journey. It impacts your day-to-day -day operations. It's in your employee handbook. And it's something that has to evolve 
And it's something that involves surveys and hearing what your employees have to say. Very important items. And number five, growth opportunities. I could say everybody on this call has never wanted to go into a job that was a dead end when you started. Where can I go from here? You know, do I have to wait a thousand years till my boss keels over and leaves the company for me to get a promotion? Not going to work in this environment. And, you know, people would sooner just pick up and leave and go to the next opportunity. So if there's nothing that's going to keep them in place and show them a future in your organization, they're gone. It's just that simple. So again, employer of choice is a very important concept. Basically, it's the umbrella of why do I want to go work for you? And these are five areas that really help to get you that, not an official emblem that you can wear or a badge, but it's, you know, it's, it's what gets out into the street, what gets out into the market that identifies your company as someplace I want to go work for. They treat people well, they provide good benefits, they pay well, we share some values, and I can grow and stay there. And that's what every employer wants. You want people that are going to stay with you. You don't want to keep churning and burning and going through that. When I'm looking to hire, the first place I go is to my employees. And I um, tell them that we're looking to add uh, people to our staff and I incentivize them. You know, so we'll, you know, if they bring us somebody that we ultimately hire, they get a nice referral fee. So I found that that's been a really effective way to bring new uh, team members to our um, field staff. Um, networking, you know, just network, network, network. I'm always, whoever I'm talking to, if I've got a need for somebody, I, I mention it. You just never know where a lead is going to come from. You know, we've tried things like Indeed and, and for office staff. It, it just never pans out or um, we have never hired anybody through any of those, but we try it. You know, we always will post uh, there or a monster or, or whatever, but um, we haven't had a ton of luck with, with that. Um, what we're doing more than ever right now is outsourcing. We're hiring subcontractors and we're using, you know, other companies, employees to produce our projects. So uh, rather than paint a job myself or frame a job myself, I'm using subs and I'm just trying to lock in a price. Um, hopefully it works with uh, the line value that we used when we bid the job and um, we're using subs. And I'm finding that that has been a, a really good way to go because um, I keep throwing them business and uh, they respond, you know, if I plan ahead and let them know I need four carpenters for a month in six weeks, um, I get the manpower that I need. So um, there, there's also, you know, for speaking of manpower, that, that, that's a company in, in the construction industry. There's all sorts of um, nonprofits that have, um, you know, people that are just entering the workforce that they've trained. And, and so you can find organizations like that. We've used them in the past when we're doing demolition and, you know, we need unskilled workers. We'll, we'll go to places like that. Uh, and there's a number of them within the county. So um, you can check them out. And then lastly, you know, when we're desperate, we go to recruiters and we'll pay a fee to get the right person, especially like for um, accounting staff and um, uh, things like that. Not, th not that I have staff. I, I'd say, you know, with a small business, we call it an office manager. And I mean, they're responsible for everything, you know, I don't, I don't know where the money is. I, I, they do the checks. They, you know, they do the bank statements. So you got to have somebody you can really trust uh, there. So we'll use recruiters. We'll pay the fee. Life goes on. Um, but those are some of the ways that, that we're um, keeping up with our demands for um, staff and for production. And um, I hope some of those are, are helpful for you. I, I don't have a very long uh, presentation but I'm just uh, speaking from what we do every day, uh, which is trying to move our, our clients' projects forward. And um, it requires a lot of planning, but I think subs are the way to go, if you can, in your business.